Well, welcome. You have joined us in the middle of a series, second week of a series on the tongue, taming the tongue. Before we dive in, there's still time to leave. <laughs> but just wanted to prepare you for what we'll be discussing today. We're second week uh, watching what we speak, the words that we say, the impact that they have. If you want to address the mouth, you've got to go much deeper. If you want to get to the heart. Scripture makes it really clear. Let me read some Proverbs for you as we begin today. The reading of God's Word, Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules a spirit than he who takes a city. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Do not testify against your neighbor without a cause. And would you use your lips to mislead? Do not say, I'll do to them as they have done to me. I'll pay them back for what they did. Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And the Lord will reward you. Our main text that we've been looking at is in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Last week, we talked about the influence, the words, the influence that you have with your speech. This week, we're going to talk about the discipline in managing our mouths. For we ourselves, I said James, not Titus. <laughs> Titus is good. We all stumble in many ways, verse 2 of James 3. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is small, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Now listen to this. How great... A forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. When I was a child, I remember my mom telling me there's only one time you can stick out your tongue to somebody else. That's when you go to the doctor's office. A doctor tells you, stick out your tongue. Stick it out as far as you can. That's the only appropriate time you can stick out your tongue to somebody. Why? A doctor would take a little popsicle stick, stick it in your mouth, would shine a flashlight in there. As that light hits the tongue, it reveals things to the doctor about the rest of your body. It's fascinating what a doctor can tell just by looking at the mouth what's wrong with other parts of the body, the things that are down deeper. The Bible says the very same thing. You want to get to know someone, listen to what they say. People will tell you who they are when you interact with them. The words that they speak ultimately come from the heart. Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter. He says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned, Matthew 12, 34 through 37. Listen, for all of us, our speech reflects our hearts. Our speech reflects what's in our heart. Our mouths say something about our spiritual condition. And as we begin this conversation, it's just worth knowing there's a lot of grace in this. There's a lot of grace that God gives us as we have this conversation today. There's no one in this room immune from the past and the regret of the things that we've said in the past that we wish we could come back. Sometimes 
You say something in some slow motion, like you want to take it back. You ever waking up the next morning after a, going to a, a work party or neighborhood gathering or, or a meal with someone and you think, I can't believe I said that. Can anybody else relate? Did it, or you ask me, did I really say that? Or did I just think it? I sure hope it didn't come out of my mouth. <laughs> Plato said wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. Abraham Lincoln, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. <laughs> Ken Hughes wrote a book a number of years ago on the, the disciplines of a godly man. And in this topic, he talks about verbal cyanide. Verbal cyanide, as he describes it, he lists gossip, innuendo, flattery, criticism, Anytime we diminish another human being, it is verbal cyanide. Isaiah, in chapter 6, verse 5, he realizes the sinfulness of his speech before God. And he says, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah 6. Verse 5, again, our mouths say something about our spiritual condition. James, we looked at last week, chapter 1, quick overview. He talks about to follow Jesus. This is what true religion looks like, to be compassionate. He talks about throughout the book of James, uncompromising testimony. For followers of Jesus, that is not just one day a week. That is all week long to have a testimony that points to our relationship with Jesus, and then finally he gets really practical. He, he, there's some blessed punches in the gut that we looked at last week. When James speaks, he's he's very clear, and we're going to hear that today. James, he's a great illustrator, probably because he hung around Jesus, the greatest storyteller. He grew up in the home with Jesus, and the background of Jesus rubbed off on him. And so he's a natural scientist as he describes. And uses illustrations of ships and fire, and boats, uh, horses. Right? To the Greeks, horses and ships, very, they were very well known. That was something they worked with on a regular basis. So he uses that. In chapter 3, a few points. I'll hit them briefly as we move on to something else I want to talk about. The first, the tongue is small but powerful. It might be the most powerful organ in your body has the greatest influence, good or bad. It's one of the senses you can't see. You can see my nose on my face, good or bad. You see my eyes, you see my ears, you see my hands. My tongue is hidden from you. But it reveals the most about my heart than any other of the senses. The tongue is small but powerful. Number two, James says, you can't tame it. It is a wild horse. You can work it every day. You and I will never, ever be able to tame that thing. The tongue is humanly unattainable. The tongue speaks of evil. Every sort of evil in the world began with the thought, and then the tongue was the instrument for that evil to be communicated. The tongue, evil finds an ally in an uncontrolled tongue. Evil disposition, a tongue spreads it. Let me give you an extreme case. Hitler wrote, Mein Kemp, my story, years before he was elected into office. And he used that to spread his thoughts and his evil. Romans 1 says that's not just one case. It's all of us in this room. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. We worship creation rather than the creator. All immorality follows us. When Satan comes to God, God's God says, look at my servant. Satan was roaming the entire earth looking for someone, roaming the world, seeking someone to deceive. Third, the mouth reveals more about us than we care to admit. The mouth reveals more about us than we care to admit. And when God changes a heart, the mouth will follow. It begins, it begins with a doctor's visit. For some of us, that's, that's here today. You're not here by accident today. 
We ask God, as David says in Psalm 51, O Lord, open my lips, my mouth will declare my praise. Anytime we insult and denigrate someone else, we run down what God has made. Weeks to come, we'll look more at this. But he gives us a caution and a warning that we would not just sing praise songs on Sunday morning and walk out on Monday or even Sunday afternoon and curse others. When uh, in 1 Kings 3, 7 through 9, Moses, um, sorry, a different passage, God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. And Moses says, who are you? When I tell the people I've come down, who do I say sent me? He says, God describes himself as a God who is slow to anger. I want to talk to you mostly this morning about anger. Because what causes forest fires, as James describes here, what causes great destruction, how a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire the root of that oftentimes is someone blowing up. There's a spark that once spoken, it immediately is out of control and it causes damage and it causes people to evacuate your presence. They run and damage is done, permanent damage. You can't get that back when you when speak. So I want to talk to you about a few points on, on anger today. It's a dangerous power. It's the dynamite of the soul. All of us in the room, we've known somebody who have a quick temper. A person who has a quick temper destroys life. Proverbs talks about that. I read about anger destroying life. Anger is worse on your heart, did you know this, than anxiety, than worry, than fear extreme physical exercise that, that can take, put some stress on the heart. You know what's more worse on your heart than that is anger. It does physical damage on your body. I believe it takes days, months, years off a person's life. Within a community, it stirs up dissension. Sometimes we feel like a fool the next morning because we acted like a fool in the things that we said the, the night before. It, anger destroys our will. When we let anger overrun us, we are not making emotion, we're not making logical, reasonable decisions. We're letting emotions drive the bus on that. And sometimes the, the defense of this is, well, I'm a person who tells it like it is. Uh, I say what needs to be said. I rock the boat, and I'm proud of it. Uh, th those, those aren't verses in the Bible. <laughs> Sometimes, well, I just need to vent. Venting is not biblical. Venting is not a biblical concept. There's safe people to have conversations with, and that's necessary and needed. You talk things out in a, an appropriate way, but venting is a destructive power. There's a a dangerous power when it comes to anger. Uh, in June of last year, June 2022, a 57-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of sparking a 5,000-acre fire just north of Flagstaff. He told the deputies he was just burning a small square of toilet paper. That small square of toilet paper was placed under a rock as it burned, and then he walked away, and the next day, 5,000 acres were burning. This was up in the Coconino National Forest. The pipeline fire was first reported shortly after 10 a.m. on Sunday, six miles north of Flagstaff. Hundreds of Coconino County residents were ordered to evacuate as strong winds fanned the flames, according to emergency officials. Sometimes those small little words we're going to say, it's not that big of a deal. It does so much damage, and it's out of control before you know it. Some of us need to hear that today. The Holy Spirit's speaking to us today and the things that we want to say. We've justified the thoughts and conversations, the words that we've spoken to other people. We've justified them in our minds for years when we had no justifiable reason to ever say that. The second point on anger is there's a basic goodness in anger. You're like, what? I was told as a kid, 
don't get angry. The Bible never says don't get angry. The Bible says be angry and don't sin. So the goal is not to have no anger. I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we think, well, we just have to be peaceful people all the time and live in perfect harmony with the world. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus in John 2, he's angry, flipping tables, right? In Mark, he's angry at the Pharisees and the, the scribes. There's anger there. He's angry at the tomb of Lazarus. He's, he's angry. So we're never told don't get angry. So the goal isn't don't be angry. And the goal isn't to blow up and lose your ever-loving mind. So what's the goal? Be slow to anger. God says, Moses, tell the people, the God who is slow to anger, that's who gave you these, these commandments. May you and I be people who are slow to anger. May it take a lot for us to be angry. And we, may we be angry over the right things. There is a basic goodness in anger. The proverb I read, he is slow to anger is better than the mighty. The, the ideal is not to be angry. Listen, he that is angry without cause, that's sin. If I did not give myself enough margin when I went to Chick-fil-A before my next meeting, there's a lot of life lessons at Chick-fil-A in my world. <laughs> I now take my anger out at the clerk who's taking my order and then at the car in front of me and then the person who didn't give me my food enough. They had that, that's unjustifiable anger. That was my fault. I didn't give myself enough margin before my next meeting. I never should have gone to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> he or she who is angry without a cause sins. Okay, now listen to this. But he that is not angry when there is cause sins. There are things you and I should be angry about, and yet we're indifferent to them. Sometimes I'm more angry that I got a cold cup of coffee than I am about unjustifiable wars happening on the other side of the planet, of, of injustices that are happening all around us, and yet I am more angry, unjustifiably so, about me. God is slow to anger. Exodus 34, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. I'm so grateful God is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. He maintains his love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So the goal is not to never get angry. I would say if you don't ever get angry at anything, then there's a good chance you don't love anything. The opposite of anger, hate. Hate taken to the extreme is indifference. May we never be people who are indifferent to injustices that are happening, that, things that we should be righteously angry about. If you see the thing that you love threatened, you get angry. If you love the right things, the things that God loves, you'll get angry. If you are indifferent, you're not in love. Final form of hate is indifference. So I ask you today, when you think of the times that you get angry, why do you get angry? Ask yourself the question, why do you get angry? Is something that you love being threatened? Sometimes the thing that you love is is you, or it's, it's me. And it's a very selfish love. So number two is the basic goodness of anger. The danger of anger was number one, basic goodness of anger, number two. Number three, why anger goes wrong. Anger goes wrong because there's a disordered love that occurs. We turn good things that you and I view as good things, we turn them into ultimate things. We look to things to give us happiness and self-worth. When we love things too much, more than God, anger goes wrong. For example, if you're in a good relationship and that relationship comes to an end, there should be grief, there should be sadness. Maybe there's some 
some anger there. But it should not cause us to go lose our mind, to blow up, to throw things, to slam doors. That is replacing the ultimate thing with the good thing. The ultimate thing for you and I is our relationship with God is the ultimate. And nothing in our life should ever replace the ultimate love that we have for God. There's a disordered love is one of the reasons why anger goes, goes wrong. The other is that there's a, our anger is disordered. We feel slighted because we, f- we care about people's affection. We care about how people view us. And when someone attacks us, causes us to get angry. How dare they attack me? How th- dare they say that about me? Because now I care about my reputation. Anytime someone or something gets between you and what you love, we become impeccably angry. Is there anything in your life that you absolutely have to have? And when something gets in the way of that, anger boils over. There's a disordered proportion. I mentioned that earlier, where there's this very small thing that's happening in my life right now the amount of anger I have over it is disproportionate to the things I really should be righteously anger over. My daughter works as a barista at a coffee shop. She tells me stories of how people behave at a coffee shop. It's, it's unbelievable. In the drive through line, when they walk in, the things that they say, people throwing coffee at people. It's like, and I, little dad coaching, I say, you know it's not about the coffee, right? When people have that sort of ridiculous anger that comes out. It is not about the coffee. There's something else going on, not from their mouth, where? In their heart. There's something else going on there. And they just happen to be the person in front of them who's, who's receiving that. And we've all received that from someone else. Someone, quote unquote, verbally throws up on you. You happen to be a recipient, but it had nothing to do with you. Disordered proportion. And then the third is disordered goal. So again, the goal isn't not to be angry and the goal isn't to blow up. It's, it's to be slow to anger. There was a time, I have, I have three adult daughters. By God's grace, I'm so grateful for them and God's grace has shown up in our home so many times. When we moved to Arizona 11 years ago, they were late elementary and middle school years, which is never a good time in general. Middle school, it's rough, it's difficult, it's hard. And now we had just taken them from their friends and family, similar to what the Sandovals went through following Jesus coming to Phoenix. But we moved uh, to Phoenix, and they were struggling. It was really hard. We were standing around the kitchen counter island, and one of my daughters had a lot of bracelets on both of her wrists. And my wife just happens, felt like uh, she, she feels like it was a Holy Spirit moment, and said, hey, can you move your bracelets? To one of our daughters, and she did, and there were some marks of cutting on her wrist. And we're so grateful that God allowed us to see that. I'm so grateful that God's gracious to me even when I don't respond the right way. What? Your life is not so hard. You're in a loving home. We care for you. How can you be cutting? I didn't handle it right. I responded inappropriately. I was hurt. I had, my love for my, my daughter was being threatened. She was being threatened. And I, I took out my anger on a person rather than the sin. And so often we take anger out on people rather than the foolishness or the, the foolishness of the idea or, the, or take it out on the sin or take it out on the addiction or take it out on whatever is causing harm to the person. That's what we should be angry about, but not on the person. And in that moment, I responded inappropriately, and, and I took it out on my daughter. It came from the right motivation, but it was, it was wrong. Later that day, my other daughter, we were having a conversation, and she said, Dad, do you think if, if she's not enjoying life, if she's struggling with life, that you yelling at her is the right, the right thing? <laughs> You're right. And we got counseling, and 
we worked through all of that. So, so grateful it wasn't too far down the road. There weren't deep cuts under the skin, but when things don't go how we think they should go in our life, we get angry, right? We respond and we lash out, we blow up, and we slam doors, we insult people, we call each other names. When our anger should never be directed at a person, Boulder Mountain, may our anger be directed in the right direction place. There are a lot of things in this world that we should be angry about. It's okay to be angry at things. Let's not be angry at people. God is slow to anger. Jesus is not angry with you. Jesus loves you so much that he's angry at the things that cause harm to you and me. And those things he wants to remove from your life. And he loves you so much. He's like, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to listen to that. I don't want you to do that thing. I want you to end that relationship. Why? Because Not because I'm angry with you, because I love you. And I don't want more scars upon you. And so I'm angry at the sin. I'm angry at the addiction. Disordered anger. When that goes and that goes wrong. My disordered love, our goal is not to destroy the child in parenting. It's to address surgically the problems, the sin, while keeping the person intact and healthy. It is so difficult. It's easy to talk about this. It's difficult. This is, really, this is the combination of love and lead. It's, it's the conversation of being so honest with somebody out of a great motivation of love as opposed to lashing out and blowing up, right? Now it's going to take years to, to resolve that. Some of us in the room today, we, we have anger issues. And so as, as we come here now to the time, what do we do about it? What, how do we address anger, uh, prayer, the Holy Spirit. I've, as we've started this series, I can't tell you how much more aware I am of my conversations. Before I send that email, before I send that text, before I make a post, before I have a conversation, am I being kind? Am I being clear? Followers of Jesus, we should be the most kind and clear people, not just nice. Nice is good. But nice leaves out honesty and clarity. So often we exchange being nice for being kind. <clears throat> kind includes the ability to be honest with somebody and speak truth. What does Jesus do? He speaks truth to us. There is sin in our life. He speaks truth. To us. Jesus has never been angry with you. Jesus has never debated with you. Jesus has never argued with you, but Jesus has been truthful. Be truthful. What does it look like to love and lead in conversations? Uh, admit it. It takes a great deal of vulnerability to admit that I struggle with anger. To admit to somebody else that how you've handled things in the past were not healthy and were not appropriate. Maybe you don't have an overall problem with anger, but there's that, there was that one time. Admit it. Set up some boundaries in your relationships. Who are the people that caused you the emotion of anger to rise up the most? Set some boundaries. Boundaries are helpful and healthy. Do you know that in the Lord's Prayer, boundaries are mentioned, trespasses? Forgive those who trespass on me and forgive me when I trespass on them. I have the idea of a barbed wire fence. And there are people who are trespassing upon you and you haven't set those boundaries up. So set some boundaries. In marriage, what are the boundaries in marriage? If there's certain topics that cause anger, maybe, maybe say, we're only going to have this conversation in, in public. We're going to set a day and a time to have this conversation. We're not going to name call. We're never going to use insulting words at another person. We're going to be clear and kind. We're going to have daily compliments. 
Think of interactions you have with people. Think of what's something you can say about them, right? This is, this is basic stuff we were all taught as kids. Be kind. If you don't have something nice to say, keep your mouth shut. Daily compliments. If you're in a marriage relationship, brag on your spouse in public. I mean, brag about them. Don't lie. <laughs> the things that are, they're good at. Publicly boast about them in front of them to other people. Daily compliments. Your tongue, your mouth has great power when you walk into a room. So the goal is not to be angry, and the goal isn't to blow up. The goal is to be slow to anger and move toward those relationships with a surgical strike. Be mad at the foolishness that the person is experiencing. Don't be angry at the person. Love and lead. Address the idiocy of the person. Maybe the thought life and how they came to the conclusion. Target that with truth and with grace and with love. <clears throat> Martin Luther King says in a sermon, he quote, I'll read this. Another way that you love your enemy is this. When the opportunity presents itself for you to defeat your enemy, that is the time which you must not do it. There will come a time in many instances when the person who hates you the most, the person who has misused you the most, the person who has gossiped about you the most, the person who has spread false rumors about you the most, there will come a time when you will have an opportunity to defeat that person. It might be in terms of a recommendation for a job. It might be in terms of helping that person to make some move in life. That's the time you must do it. That is the meaning of love. What is Martin Luther King saying? Number one, he's taking this from the text that Jesus speaks. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you and persecute you and insult you and say all kinds of th evil manner against you. But he's also saying, hate segregation, but love the segregationist. Hate the sin. Love the sinner. It's what God did with us. When God changes the heart, the mouth will follow. What God did for each and every one of us, when we were mad at God, when we wanted this, when we were greedy, we wanted that, we mocked Jesus, we tortured Jesus, we were, we were angry with Jesus, and he took our anger, and he took God's anger. Jesus on the cross took our anger, and he took the wrath of God. Anytime the cup is mentioned in the Bible, it talks about the wrath and the anger of God. It did not come to you and I. It went to Jesus on the cross. You see, God didn't pay us back. God loved us at our very worst when we were lashing out at the worst of our pride. God loved us. And he sent Jesus. And Jesus has always been kind. And he's always been loving. He's never said a hurtful word. He's never been defensive. He's never argued. He's never debated. Instead, he went to the cross. And even on the cross, he used his words to forgive and to glorify his Father. As he goes to the cross, when we look at the cross, he tells us the truth. He doesn't ignore the truth. He doesn't ignore our sin. He addresses our sin. He pays the price for us. He absorbed our rage and he drank the cup of God's anger. I don't know what action item needs to happen today. Ask for forgiveness for the anger inappropriately displayed in times in our life. Maybe there's a situation in your life right now where you, you, you want to send that email. It's, it's written and it's in draft form. You haven't sent it yet and you need to go home. Just delete it. And pray for that person. Let God vindicate you. We get into trouble when we vindicate ourselves. Whole forests and cities burn down when we do that. Very practical words from James today. Maybe there's some boundaries that need to be set. You need to go home. You need to write some boundaries. I'd say don't, don't come up with 50 boundaries. Have just a couple based on your behavior and your patterns of your life? What are some things that 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? This is a topic you can't solve yourself. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, God can change. God can do an organ transplant. Like, well, I just need to fix my... No, you, some of us need a whole transplant in this area. And God, God's in the business. This is what he does. He transforms lives. I've seen people who this was a real issue in their life and now they're a completely different person. That's, the, that's, that's what God does. He's in the, the business of transforming behaviors and patterns and unhealth. Would you join me in prayer? So Father, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, God, you would send the Holy Spirit in this moment to, to prick our hearts, convict us, remind us some of us, we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to ask for grace. Marriage relationships in the room, we need to, we, there's a different way. There's a different way. We are on the same team. May we use our words to uplift, encourage, speak truth, show love and grace and kindness and clarity. Thank you for this very practical message today, God, that you gave us through the book of James. And I pray that whatever you're asking us to do, we would have the courage to do it. Give us the wisdom and the courage to respond appropriately. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.